Section 8 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 8. The Lincoln Stone Protest. On the 3rd of March, the day before the legislature adjourned, Mr. Lincoln caused to be entered upon its records a paper which excited but little interest at the time, but which will probably be remembered long after the good and evil actions of the Vandalia Assembly have faded away from the minds of men. It was the authentic record of the beginning of a great and momentous career. The following protest was presented to the House which was read and ordered to be spread on the journals, to wit, Resolutions upon the subject of domestic slavery having passed both branches of the General Assembly at its present session, the undersigned hereby protest against the passage of the same. They believe that the institution of slavery is founded on both injustice and bad policy but that the promulgation of abolition doctrines tends rather to increase than abate its evils. They believe that the Congress of the United States has no power under the Constitution to interfere with the institution of slavery in the different states. They believe that the Congress of the United States has the power under the Constitution to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia, but that the power ought not to be exercised unless at the request of the people of the district. The difference between these opinions and those contained in the above resolutions is their reason for entering this protest. Signed, Dan Stone, A. Lincoln, Representatives from the County of Sangamon. It may seem strange to those who shall read these pages that a protest so mild and cautious as this should ever have been considered either necessary or remarkable. We have gone so far away from the habits of thought and feeling prevalent at that time that it is difficult to appreciate such acts at their true value. But if we look a little carefully into the state of politics and public opinion in Illinois in the first half of this century, we shall see how much of inflexible conscience and reason there was in this simple protest. The whole of the Northwest Territory had, it is true, been dedicated to freedom by the Ordinance of 1787. But in spite of that famous prohibition, slavery existed in a modified form throughout that vast territory, wherever there was any considerable population. An act legalizing a sort of slavery by indenture was passed by the Indiana Territorial Legislature in 1807, and this remained in force in the Illinois country after its separation. Another act providing for the hiring of slaves from southern states was passed in 1814 for the ostensible reason that Mills could not be successfully operated in the territory for want of laborers, and that the manufacture of salt could not be successfully carried on by white laborers. Yet, in an unconscious satire upon such pretenses, from time to time the most savage acts were passed to prohibit the immigration of free Negroes into the territory, which was represented as pining for black labor. Those who held slaves under the French domination, and their heirs, continued to hold them and their descendants in servitude, after Illinois had become nominally a free territory and a free state, on the ground that their vested rights of property could not have been abrogated by the ordinance, and that under the rule of the civil law partus sequitur ventrum. But this quasi-toleration of the institution was not enough for the advocates of slavery. Soon after the adoption of the state constitution which prohibited slavery hereafter, it was evident that there was strong undercurrent of desire for its introduction into the state. Some of the leading politicians, exaggerating the extent of this desire, imagined they saw in it a means of personal advancement, and began to agitate the question of a convention to amend the Constitution. At that time, there was a considerable emigration setting through the state from Kentucky and Tennessee to Missouri. Day by day, the teams of movers passed through the Illinois settlements, and wherever they halted for rest and refreshments, they would affect to deplore the short-sighted policy which, by prohibiting slavery, had prevented their settling in that beautiful country. When young bachelors came from Kentucky on trips of business or pleasure, 
they dazzled the eyes of the women and excited the envy of their male rivals with their black retainers. The early Illinoisans were perplexed with a secret and singular sense of inferiority to even so new and raw a community as Missouri because of its possessions of slavery. Governor Edwards, complaining so late as 1829 of the superior male facilities afforded to Missouri, says, I can conceive of no reason for this preference, unless it be supposed that because the people of Missouri have Negroes to work for them, they are to be considered as gentlefolks entitled to higher consideration than us plain free state folks who have to work for ourselves. The attempt was at last seriously made to open the state to slavery by the legislature of 1822 through 3. The governor, Edward Coles, of Virginia, a strong anti-slavery man, had been elected by a division of the pro-slavery party, but came in with a legislature largely against him. The Senate had the requisite pro-slavery majority of two-thirds for a convention. In the House of Representatives, there was a contest for a seat upon the result of which the two-thirds majority depended. The seat was claimed by John Shaw and Nicholas Hansen of Pike County. The way in which the contest was decided affords a curious illustration of the moral sense of the advocates of slavery. They wanted at this session to elect a senator and provide for the convention. Hansen would vote for their senator and not for the convention. Shaw would vote for the convention but not for Thomas, their candidate for senator. In such a dilemma, they determined not to choose, but impartially to use both. They gave the seat to Hansen, and with his vote elected Thomas. They then turned him out, gave the place to Shaw, and with his vote carried the act for submitting the convention question to popular vote. They were not more magnanimous in their victory than scrupulous in the means by which they had gained it. The night after the vote was taken, they formed in a wild and drunken procession and visited the residences of the governor and the other free state leaders with loud and indecent demonstrations of triumph. They considered their success already assured, but they left out of view the value of the moral forces called into being by their insolent challenge. The better class of people in the state, those heretofore unknown in politics, the schoolmasters, the ministers, immediately prepared for the contest, which became one of the severest the state has ever known. They established three newspapers and sustained them with money and contributions. The governor gave his entire salary for four years to the expenses of this contest, in which he had no personal interest whatever. The anti-slavery members of the legislature made up a purse of a thousand dollars. They spent their money mostly in printer's ink and in the payment of active and zealous colporters. The result was a decisive defeat for the slave party. The convention was beaten by 1,800 majority in a total vote of 11,612, and the state saved forever from slavery. But these supreme efforts of the advocates of public morals, uninfluenced by considerations of personal advantage, are of rare occurrence and necessarily do not survive the exigencies that call them forth. The apologists of slavery, beaten in the canvas, were more successful in the field of social opinion. In the reaction which succeeded the triumph of the anti-slavery party, it seemed as if there had never been any anti-slavery sentiment in the state. They had voted, it is true, against the importation of slaves from the South, but they were content to live under a code of draconian ferocity, inspired by the very spirit of slavery, visiting the immigration of free Negroes with penalties of the most savage description. Even Governor Coles, the public-spirited and popular politician, was indicted and severely fined for having brought his own freedmen into the state and having assisted them in establishing themselves around him on farms of their own. The legislature remitted the fine, but the circuit court declared it had no constitutional power to do so, though the Supreme Court afterwards overruled this decision. Any mention of the subject of slavery was thought in the worst possible taste, and no one could avow himself opposed to it without the risk of social ostracism. Every town had its one or two abolitionists who were regarded as harmless or dangerous lunatics, according to the energy with which they made their views known. From this arose a singular prejudice against New England people. It was attributable partly to the natural feeling of distrust of strangers, which is common to ignorance and provincialism, but still more 
to a general suspicion that all Eastern men were abolitionists. Mr. Cook, who so long represented the state in Congress, used to relate with much amusement how he once spent the night in a farmer's cabin and listened to the honest man's denunciation of that Yankee Cook. Cook was a Kentuckian, but his enemies could think of no more dreadful stigma to apply to him than that of calling him a Yankee. Senator James A. McDougall once told us that although he made no pretense of concealing his eastern nativity, he never could keep his ardent friends in Pike County from denying the fact and fighting anyone who asserted it. The great preacher, Peter Cartwright, used to denounce eastern men roundly in his sermons, calling them imps who lived on oysters, instead of honest cornbread and bacon. The taint of slavery, the contagion of a plague they had not quite escaped, was on the people of Illinois. They were strong enough to rise once in their might, and say they would not have slavery among them. But in the petty details of every day, in their ordinary talk, and in their routine legislation, their sympathies were still with the slaveholders. They would not enlist with them, but they would fight their battles in their own way. Their readiness to do what came to be called later in a famous speech, the dirty work of the South, was seen in the tragic death of Reverend Elijah P. Lovejoy in this very year of 1837. He had for some years been publishing a religious newspaper in St. Louis, but finding the atmosphere of that city becoming dangerous to him on account of the freedom of his comments upon southern institutions, he moved to Alton in Illinois, 25 miles further up the river. His arrival excited an immediate tumult in that place. A mob gathered there on the day he came, it was Sunday, and the good people were at leisure, and threw his press into the Mississippi. Having thus expressed their determination to vindicate the law, they held a meeting and cited him before it to declare his intentions. He said they were altogether peaceful and legal, that he intended to publish a religious newspaper and not to meddle with politics. This seemed satisfactory to the people, and he was allowed to fish out his press, buy new types, and set up his paper. But Mr. Lovejoy was a predestined martyr. He felt there was a woe upon him if he held his peace against the wickedness across the river. He wrote and published what was in his heart to say, and Alton was again vehemently moved. A committee appointed itself to wait upon him, for this sort of outrage is usually accomplished with a curious formality, which makes it seem to the participants legal and orderly. The preacher met them with an undaunted front, and told them he must do his duty as it appeared to him, that he was amenable to law, but nothing else. He even spoke in condemnation of mobs. Such language, from a minister of the gospel, shocked and infuriated the committee and those whom they represented. The people assembled, says Governor Ford, and quietly took the press and types and threw them into the river. We venture to say that the word, quietly, never before found itself in such company. It is not worth while to give the details of the bloody drama that now rapidly ran to its close. There was a fruitless effort at compromise, which to Lovejoy meant merely surrender, and which he firmly rejected. The threats of the mob were answered by defiance from the little band that surrounded the abolitionist. A new press was ordered and arrived, and it was stored in a warehouse where Lovejoy and his friends shut themselves up, determined to defend it with their lives. They were there besieged by the infuriated crowd, and after a short interchange of shots, Lovejoy was killed, his friends dispersed, and the press once more, and this time finally, thrown into the turbid flood. These events took place in the autumn of 1837, but they indicate sufficiently the temper of the people of the state in the earlier part of the year. The vehemence with which the early anti-slavery apostles were conducting their agitation in the East naturally roused a corresponding violence of expression in every other part of the country. William Lloyd Garrison, the boldest and most aggressive non-resistant that ever lived, had, since 1831, been pouring forth once a week in The Liberator his earnest and eloquent denunciations of slavery taking no account of the expedient or the possible, but demanding with all the fervor of an ancient prophet the immediate removal of the cause of offense. Oliver Johnson attacked the national sin and wrong in the standard with zeal and energy equally hot and untiring. Their words stung the slaveholding states to something like frenzy. 
The Georgia legislature offered a reward of $5,000 to anyone who should kidnap Garrison or who should bring to conviction anyone circulating the liberator in the state. Yet so little known in their own neighborhoods were these early workers in this great reform that when the mayor of Boston received remonstrances from certain southern states against such an incendiary publication as the liberator, he was able to say that no member of the city government and no person of his acquaintance had ever heard of the paper or its editor, that on search being made it was found that his office was an obscure hole, his only visible auxiliary a negro boy, and his supporters a very few insignificant persons of all colors. But the leaven worked continually, and by the time of which we are writing, the anti-slavery societies of the Northeast had attained a considerable vitality, and the echoes of their work came back from the South in furious resolutions of legislatures and other bodies, which, in their exasperation, could not refrain from this injudicious advertising of their enemies. Petitions to Congress, which were met by gag laws, constantly increasing in severity, brought the dreaded discussion more and more before the public. But there was as yet little or no anti-slavery agitation in Illinois. There was no sympathy with, nor even toleration, for any public expression of hostility to slavery. The zeal of the followers of Jackson, although he had ceased to be president, had been wedded by his public denunciation of the anti-slavery propaganda. Little more than a year before, he had called upon Congress to take measures to prohibit under severe penalties the further progress of such incendiary proceedings as were calculated to stimulate the slaves to insurrection and to produce all the horrors of civil war. But in spite of all this, people with uneasy consciences continued to write and to talk and petition Congress against slavery, and most of the state legislatures began to pass resolutions denouncing them. In the last days of 1836, Governor Duncan sent to the Illinois legislature the reports and resolutions of several states in relation to this subject. They were referred to a committee, who in due time reported a set of resolves highly disapproving abolition societies, holding that the right of property in slaves is secured to the slaveholding states by the federal constitution, that the general government cannot abolish slavery in the District of Columbia against the consent of the citizens of said district without a manifest breach of good faith, and requesting the governor to transmit to the states which had sent their resolutions to him a copy of those tranquilizing expressions. A long and dragging debate ensued of which no record has been preserved. The resolutions, after numberless amendments had been voted upon, were finally passed in the Senate unanimously in the House with none but Lincoln and five others in the negative. Footnote. We are under obligation to John M. Adair for transcripts of the state records bearing on this matter. End footnote. No report remains of the many speeches which prolonged the debate. They have gone the way of all bunkum. The sound and fury of them have passed away into silence. But they awoke an echo in one sincere heart, which history will be glad to perpetuate. There was no reason that Abraham Lincoln should take a special notice of these resolutions, more than another. He had done his work at this session in effecting the removal of the capital. He had only to shrug his shoulders at the violence and untruthfulness of the majority, vote against them, and go back to his admiring constituents, to his dinners and his toasts. But his conscience and his reason forbade him to be silent. He felt a word must be said on the other side to redress the distorted balance. He wrote his protest, saying not one word he was not ready to stand by then and thereafter, wasting not a syllable in rhetoric or feeling, keeping close to law and truth and justice. When he had finished it, he showed it to some of his colleagues for their adhesion, but one and all refused, except Dan Stone, who was not a candidate for re-election, having retired from politics to a seat on the bench. The risk was too great for the rest to run. Lincoln was twenty-eight years old. After a youth of singular privations and struggles, he had arrived at an enviable position in the politics and the society of the state. His intimate friends, those whom he loved and honored, were Browning, Butler, Logan, and Stewart, Kentuckians all, and strongly averse to any discussion of the question of slavery. The public opinion of his county, which was then little less than the breath of his life, was all the same way. But all these considerations could not withhold him from performing a simple duty, 
a duty which no one could have blamed him for leaving undone. The crowning grace of the whole act is in the closing sentence. The difference between these opinions and those contained in the said resolutions is their reason for entering this protest. Reason enough for the Lincolns and the Luthers. He had many years of growth and development before him. There was a long distance to be traversed between the guarded utterances of this protest and the heroic audacity which launched the proclamation of emancipation. But the young man who dared declare, in the prosperous beginnings of his political life, in the midst of a community imbued with slave state superstitions, that he believed the institution of slavery was founded on both injustice and bad policy, attacking thus its moral and material supports, while at the same time recognizing all the constitutional guarantees which protected it, had in him the making of a statesman, and if need be, a martyr. His whole career was to run in the lines marked out by these words, written in the hurry of a closing session, and he was to accomplish few acts in that great history which God reserved for him, wiser and nobler than this. End of section 8. Recording by Jesse Crisp Sears in Pittsburgh, North Carolina.